you have your Bibles, you may like to have them open at the sections we read at the end of 1 Kings and into 2 Kings. Over the past five weeks, we've been looking at this gentle giant of a man, Elijah, who seems to possess so many paradoxes and contradictions. He had the appearance of a nomadic gypsy, as we read in Second Kings chapter 1 and verse 8. He wore a garment of hair cloth with a girdle of leather about his loins. And yet for all this straggly appearance, he had the nobility given to him by one whom God had commanded to go and tell forth his word and he respected, he commanded the respect of kings and army captains, we see. He had a thunderous word of rebuke to give to kings and prophets of Baal and yet this lion at the same time had a pastor's heart which could come to a widow who'd lost her only son. He could be the tenacious, unfrightened, ardent, mouthpiece of God in vain, the words of judgment upon all those who disobeyed the Lord of hosts. And yet he could at the same time, in isolation, be a suicidal loner, who goes off in timidity into the wilderness. Well, Elijah was all these. He was these contradictions. He was a complicated soul. And we no doubt feel he was a man like ourselves, as indeed he was, a man of like nature with ourselves. Now in this next look at the prophet, I'd like us first of all to survey some of the particular qualifications that made Elijah so peculiarly strong in God's sight and which made him such a useful vessel and which made him such a significant man in the history of redemption. Because you will recall that in Malachi it said that, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Elijah was to become the word used and to be the password that would open up the day of the coming of the Lord. And when Jesus came, we discover that Elijah had already come because Jesus leaves us in no doubt that the second Elijah was John the Baptist who had come to prepare the great and terrible day of the Lord. And it was Elijah, you will recall, who appeared with Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration, presumably representing the prophets with Moses as the lawgiver. All of them together shaping up to Jesus and preparing the way for him. Well, what made him and what gave him the qualifications for such a useful servant. Well, we've seen them as we've gone through. Let me first of all uh, summarize three of them briefly, which we've seen. We've first of all seen that he was a mighty intercessor. He was a man who prayed. In our first look at this man of God, we were immediately aware of his willingness to intercede and to pray to God his maker, as he prayed to him that there would be no rain and there was no rain for three years. Now you will recall that we saw that it was not that he became a man of God, a man of prayer, after he attained a particular spiritual standing. I sometimes think we have this view that once I reach a certain spiritual goal, I will be that man of prayer. But we read in James 
that he was a man of like nature with ourselves. He had all the failings. He wasn't yet your spiritual giant that we think such men of prayer are. He was a man of like nature with ourselves, says James, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. Well, he was a mighty intercessor, praying for no rain, praying for the widow's son that he might be healed and restored to life and praying for God to vindicate his name on Mount Carmel. Elijah, we saw, was a mighty intercessor. We have seen, secondly, that Elijah was a man of faith. He was, quite simply, a man of faith. By that we saw that he was a man who walked not by the sight of outward circumstances and what he sees, but by his spiritual sight of God. That is to say, when he came up against all the depressing circumstances, when he might have been dejected that he was being sent off into a wilderness where there'd been no food, where he might have been thoroughly perplexed and cast down at being so outnumbered at that confrontation on Mount Carmel. He looked not to the visible circumstances, but beyond to the one who regulates those circumstances. He looked not to the outward form, but to the invisible God. That was the quality of faith. And if I could just dwell on it for a moment. Can we take from Elijah, not that he had faith in miracles. That is not the point at all. It's not even the point that he had faith in the God of miracles. We may stand back from Elijah and say, well, there was a man who saw superhuman events and saw miraculous activities. I live in a workaday world and my routine makes for a much more mundane faith. And we say we are living on a different planet from Elijah. Our faith is a different ball game. But that is simply to miss the point. Because it's not that Elijah, I say, had faith in miracles. Nor is it even that he had faith simply in a God of miracles or in the miracles of God. What Elijah had faith in was the unfailing word of God. It was God who had said, Go and show yourself to Ahab, for I'm going to send rain. And Elijah went in faith. It was God who had spoken and said, I will feed you in the wilderness. Believe me. It wasn't, I say, that Elijah simply had faith in miracles or even in the God of miracles, but he had faith in the God who is true to his word. And so you see, we are in just the same position as Elijah. We do not have, it is true, the immediate word of God because God has given us an inscripturated word. But it is the same authoritative word that speaks. And if we are to be men of Elijah's caliber, we are to have faith in his word. So, for instance, to give just one example, when he comes to us, and says, are you not temples of the Holy Spirit within you? Is not your body a temple of the Holy Spirit? And that question comes to us, coaxing us on and instructing us to trust in the word of God and in his Holy Spirit, that he would come into our lives and be a holy cleanser in the corridors of our thoughts. Do we trust him at his word that he's able to cleanse even us? 
Well, that is just one example. But the point is made. When we cling by faith to God, we cling by faith to his word. Well, we saw that Elijah was a man who walked by faith. We saw, thirdly, that he was not only a mighty intercessor and a man of faith, but he was a man who lived a holy life. It was this supremely that qualified him to be a servant of God, fitted to stand for God on Mount Carmel, because he was uncompromisingly holy. He alone could challenge the prophets of Baal, because he had stood true to his God, he had had no fellowship with the works of darkness. He was a holy man. It was said of Elisha, his successor, by a woman who saw him many times. She said, I see this is a holy man of God who is continually passing this way. And what was true for the disciple was true for the teacher. Elijah too was a holy man of God. Well, these were three of the qualities that we saw. This man of faith, this man of prayer, and this man of a holy life. I want us to spend the rest of our time this morning looking at the one great quality that comes out of chapter 21 of 1 Kings and chapter 1 of 2 Kings. And that was the great truth, that he was a man of intrepid courage. He was a man who knew Jezebel's reputation. He was a man who knew the fate that had come to Naboth. He was a man who knew how isolated he was living in a nation of backsliders. Yet he was still prepared to face the hostility and the danger and to confront the king. Reading from chapter 1 of 1 Kings and verse 20, Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? He answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon you and I will utterly sweep you away and will cut you off from Ahab, every male, bond or free in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He boldly confronted the evil in the world. He was a man of extraordinary courage. And what he did to Ahab, we read in 2 Kings chapter 1, he similarly did to Ahaziah, the son of Ahab. Verses 15 and 16 of 2 Kings 1. Then the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. So he arose and went down with him to the king and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Because you have sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it because there is no god in the house of Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone, but you shall surely die. A man of extraordinary courage. And this is the quality we learn from the chapters we read this morning. How we need men and women of courage like that with holy boldness. How we need Elijahs in our day. How we need men like Daniel who are willing to stand alone. Or men like John the Baptist. We need these men reincarnated in our own lives. We need their qualities. We look for them. May we notice that Elijah displayed his courage in not being ashamed to speak about the judgments of God. 
he was prepared to speak frankly about the judgments of God. We may not enjoy speaking about them. We doubtless will not enjoy referring to them. But we need to be sure that there is a day of judgment, a day of reckoning. We need to be prepared to speak out in our churches and in our denomination and not to balk at the doctrine of hell. Because it is in the word of God. And we particularly need folk in everyday life to have the holy boldness that Elijah had. Can you note that it was a holy boldness? There are many people we can see who are Christians who have a spineless profanity which makes no attempt to resist the ways of the world and they are anything but bold. There is also a boldness which is extremely aggressive but it jars. It stands at a distance from people and hurls the word of God at them like stones. But what we need is our boldness on the one hand combined with our holy gentleness because when the two go together they combine to send the word of God into people's lives this is the kind of holy boldness that we need to say, see I suppose that it must have been seen in our own day most clearly in Uganda in recent days have you read the letter that the bishops of Uganda sent to their one-time leader in February 1977? You really ought to. It's an extraordinary letter of courage and boldness as they frankly explain the word of God to Amin. I commend it to you. And when Janani Luwum, the archbishop, put his pen and signed that letter. He was signing his death warrant and he died within days, shot in the mouth. We need boldness like that today. People who will stand for God. Where will we expect to see it in our times? Where will we expect to see it in the way that we will resist evil? In our places of work, in the small things, to start with at any rate in the things that we laugh at and the things that we don't laugh at may we stand as bold testimonies to the word of God we will expect to see it in the deliberate concern that we show for those people whom the world has rejected and cast off we will see it that is in the way that we come alongside the neighbors of this world and plead their cause and take up our concern for those who have been oppressed and despised. We will expect to see it in our willingness to speak out against evil and above all we will expect to see it in our defence of the glory of God such as Elijah made in defending God to Ahaziah against Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies. How we need this holy boldness. Whatever it means for us, whether it means that we will command respect for us, sometimes it will, or whether it means that we will be hated, the offscourings of all the earth, as Paul described himself. We seek a boldness. I seek a boldness. Do you seek a boldness for Jesus? And as we seek to put on Elijah's intrepid courage, can we note this? To have courage is not to have an absence of fear. That is not the quality of Christian courage. 
Christian courage has a redirected fear. The limp, flabby Christian who swims the way of the world and will not go against the tide, he has a fear. He has a fear of men. But the child of God who has backbone and stands boldly and defiantly against all that's wrong, he too has a fear. He has a wholesome fear of God, a fear of his justice and his righteousness, a fear of his holy name. Can we covet and develop and cultivate the courage of Elijah which involves a fear of God. Well, these are the qualities that we see in Elijah. And we see that he was a man who prayed. He was a man of faith. He was a man with a holy life. And he was a man of untold courage which we greatly need. He was a man, of course, who had a great God. And that was what supremely made him what he was. He was a man who had a great God. And he trusted in that God. He was a God who knew what was best to Elijah. Elijah had at one time asked for death. God said, you don't want to die. He could have granted Elijah's request at that time in Horeb, and he could have caused Elijah to die then. But as we see today in the last chapter that we read, God had something better for Elijah. He had to take him and to bypass death by means of the heavenly helicopter, as someone has described, chapter 2 of 2 Kings and verse 1, the whirlwind that took Elijah to the presence of God. When we get to heaven, Elijah presumably will have had his resurrection body for centuries, one of the few. He had a great God who rewarded him. May we trust in the same God because he's trustworthy and true 